This is Zach Taylor with Semaphore Software. This video is a complete guide for using Signal Scout. You can jump directly to any part of the video by using the chapter information or the timestamped links provided in the information section below. If you are just getting started with Signal Scout, installation and initial setup instructions are at the end of the video. As always, if you have any questions, would like to learn more, or would like to get set up with a trial of Signal Scout, you can go to our website www.semaphoresoftware.co or contact us using the information provided in the video description. Let's get started. In order to load logs or live view in Signal Scout, you'll need to show it where programs are that you'll be utilizing. To do that, you go up to the top of the main screen and next to Applications folder, click on the Ellipses box. From here, you'll select the parent folder of all of your application files. I've placed all the application files for this demo inside this folder. If you double click on it, you'll see I have a lot of subfolders in here that contain those programs. I don't have to select them all individually. All I need to do is select the top level folder and then click Select Folder. This will cause Signal Scout to look through all the folders and find the application logic programs that it will then be able to use. As you can see, we've now populated the table with information pulled from those programs, such as location name, area and subdivision, CRCs, checksums, and other information. The log view section just below the applications folder is where you will go when you want to open up a log to view. All you need to do is click the ellipses button here, navigate to where your logs are store stored, and select the log. After you do that, Signal Scout will compare the CRC and checksum inside the log to the programs you have available and open the appropriate program. This way you can make sure that the logic you're viewing does absolutely match the log that you're viewing, and you'll get an accurate representation of the log status as you click through it. We'll go into the actual log view in a different part of the video. The live view portion of the main screen is outlined in a blue box. In here, you'll see all the programs that are available for live view. Simply click on one of these locations and it'll highlight the program. You have to make sure that the connection information is correct so that when Signal Scout tries to connect to the box, it's trying to access it at the right location. This also includes the login information that can be set under the edit screen. Once you've selected the location you want to see the live view for, simply click the live view button. From Signal Scout's main window, there are two additional pieces of information that are available under the help menu. The first is the about which tells the version that you're running for, of Signal Scout to tell whether you're on the most up-to-date version. And the second under the help menu is the key. The key is a cheat sheet of sorts to reference if you have any questions about any of the symbols or colors used in Signal Scout. You can keep this open while you're utilizing Live View or Log View to reference back to until you get comfortable with all of the different symbols and understanding what they all mean. Some information about each of the programs can be edited. In order to edit and view what those properties are, select a location and then click the Edit button. This will bring up the Edit Application Information window. Here you can see we have editable fields. The location name and subdivision can be changed to match whatever particular naming convention you want to establish. The vital CRCs and checksums cannot be changed in any way. You cannot delete or modify these. The IP address for Electrologics where you're going to access the box as well as the username and password to access the box are also editable fields. If you want to change the username and password for all the locations that you have loaded in the live view window, simply check the change all box. You can also retire a program by selecting the checkbox here to show the program is retired. And if you want to go back to the defaults that were pulled by Signal Scout, simply click the Restore Defaults button. 
To save your changes, click Save, and you'll see the updates in the table view. To display the function of ladder views, we'll make use of a log view. So simply go into the log view section, select the ellipses button, and open up a log. We'll start our review of the ladder view window by identifying all the major portions of it. In the title, we identify whether we're in log view or live view, which location we're looking at, as well as the area and subdivision. On the left hand side is where you make your variable selections. Listed here are all the variables that have equations built for them within this program. If I left click on one of these variables, it'll show up here in the main section of the window. This main section here is where we draw all of the variables and the equations behind them. If you select an equation here within this location with a left click, it'll give the equation behind it, and it'll continue to give equations as long as they exist. But eventually you may get to a location on one of these bits where it's actually a direct input. If I left click on that, it'll pop up a, uh, a box that tells more information about where that bit is actually coming from. This can help troubleshooting in live and uh, logged time by letting you know exactly where the fault of your problem may have originated from. If you want to get rid of bits from this screen, just simply click a left click on those bits again to make them disappear. There's also information in the lower left hand screen about the last bit that you've moused over. Since I last moused over the two SAR, I get information such as the current state being true, and the time since it's last changed, and the time until the variable will next change. Along the bottom side of the screen, I have controls over my time. This scroll bar lets me move forward in time or backward in time through the log. The current time is also displayed right here, and it can also limit the duration within the log that I'm actually viewing using either of these boxes. This one restricts the upper limit, and this one restricts the lower limit. Signal Scout tries to draw user attention to st state changes by highlighting variables that have just changed with a yellow background. As you can see, when scrolling through the log forwards in time, each time a bit state changes, that bit is highlighted. This will allow the user to see the difference between one timestamp and the next and draw their attention to the most important information. This is particularly useful when lots of information is being displayed on the screen simultaneously, and it's hard to keep in mind exactly the previous state when going to the next. In the main window here, we have a number of ways of interacting with Signal Scout. First of all, let's describe some of the symbols and information provided. On the very left hand side of any equation is the power source or beginning of the equation. This is where the equivalent of the battery starts. So this is colored green to indicate that battery power is starting here. And as long as there's a continuous path, the green uh, line will continue. As you can see, there's a green path all the way through the ladder logic here to pick the two SAR relay. If we move through time, we may be able to find a time when the bit goes false. As you can see here, we have power going up until this spot where it stops and all the lines turn red. Because there's no longer power going to the relay coil, the relay goes false. Sometimes with bits, all the information is not present to the logs. For instance, in some locations, not all bits are recorded. Unrecorded variables are identified with dashed lines, and this in particular relay is unrecorded. But what you'll notice is that this particular relay also has a bit state, so it doesn't show up as unknown. The reason for that is because Signal Scout has tried to infer or figure out the state of that bit, and since it's done so, it puts a gray box around that variable. It doesn't want the user to believe that this is information pulled from a log, and that's why the gray box is placed around there. There are also a couple of bits that are unknown. This often happens when a bit never changes state throughout, 
throughout the entirety of a log, which is often the case with vital configuration bits or statuses that change very infrequently. If the user knows the state of those bits and wants to set them for his own use, you can do so by right-clicking and selecting to set the variable. In this case, I know the variable to be in the false state, so I'm going to set variable false. When I do so, it's going to show the variable false, and it's going to place a blue box around the variable to show the user that the user has defined the state and that it is not part of the log. I can also set it to true or unknown, or I can clear its state by selecting from the context menu as well. The last item in the context menu is the show all instances button. This can be done on any variable, and what it will do is bring up all the equations where that particular bit is used. The, P, the one PSOI is used in many locations, as you can see, because it's just brought up all the different equations where the one PSOI is located. This can help give the user an idea of how the variables are used in various programs. The user may also want to directly view or control inputs to the unit. To do this, simply click on the Show All Direct Inputs checkbox in the lower left. This will bring up a new window with all of the direct inputs identified by module. As you can see here, the information is very similar to that of the display screen, where we disable bits that are known and leave them enabled when their states are unknown and allow the user to change those states. Bits that are shown with an empty box are in the false state, partially checked are unknown, and fully checked are true. If I were to click on one of these states with a left click, it would go to a blue highlight to show that I have, as the user, changed this variable state. And then you can see that that information is reflected back into the program. So if I change this to true, we can see the variable state go true and that that is a user set state. All the same uh, right click context menus are available through the direct input window as are available in the ladder view. Similarly to the ladder view, the user can input a variable search here in the direct inputs to find a particular input. This is particularly useful with large numbers of inputs coming from re remote locations where this could be a very full screen. If you have never used Signal Scout, the first thing you will need to do is download the software. You can download and set up the software without a product key by going to the website www.semaphoresoftware.co. From here, click on the Signal Scout tab. This will link you to the Signal Scout product page and you'll be able to download the latest version of the software from the top of the page. Simply download the zip file onto your computer and then extract the files anywhere on your computer. Once the files are extracted onto your computer, open the folder. Inside the folder, you'll find four files. The first is a readme file, which contains information, much as you'll find in this video, about how to use the product, uh, questions that you may need answers to, and a normal user's guide. There's also an end user's license agreement and a revision history, so you can see what's changed throughout the different releases of Signal Scout. And finally, is Signal Scout itself. There is no installation. All you need to do is double click on the signalscout.exe and that will open the program for the first time. If you're using Signal Scout for the first time, you'll want to visit the settings window to address a few things before you get started. To do this, simply go to file and click on settings. This will bring up the settings window. The most important item to address here is the product key. Signal Scout will run without a product key, but its function will be limited. Simply paste your product key into this field and then click Validate Key. Doing so will identify how much time the key has remaining on it before it becomes invalid. The highlighted section of the Settings window addresses GEIF files. GEIF files are needed 
when utilizing Signal Scout to view programs that are generated by the ACE compiler. These are normally within the Electrologics family, such as XP4, DLC, and Electrocode 5. In order for the program to know how to use these files, you must have GEIF files created for each application program. You can do one of two things here. Either get the GEIF file provided to you by someone else and place them in the same folder as your application programs on your computer, or you can use Signal Scout to generate GEIF files for you. In order to do this, you'll need to have ACE 5.8 or later installed on your computer. Once you've installed ACE 5.8 or later onto your computer, you'll need to tell Signal Scout where that installation has occurred. Go to the right of the ACE path and click on the three dot button, ellipses button. This will bring up a menu where you can select the location that you've installed the ACE compiler. For default installations, this will be under your Program Files, Alstom, Logic Station, whichever version you're running, and then ACE. Then you'll select the ACE.exe application and click Open. As you can see, the box is now filled, and Signal Scout will now be able to generate GEIF programs for all of the application software that you have loaded on your computer. The next setting down addresses retired programs. A retired program is a program that is no longer in service on a given railroad, but you may still have the software on your computer and not want to get rid of it. You may not want to get rid of it because you may still use it to review logs of old items uh, in a training scenario or, or just wanting to keep things around. But you may not want to have it confused with the currently in service software when utilizing LiveView. In order to set whether a program is retired or not, you'll do that through the settings menu, which is covered elsewhere in this video. But if you want to display those retired files, which is not the default, you'll click this checkbox right here. Leaving the checkbox unchecked will hide retired programs in the main menu, in the main window, but checking it will show those in the main window. The ladder view size scaling option allows you to change how things are displayed in the ladder view uh, from the text size as well as the draw size for the variables. Going above one, which is the de default value, will increase the size and going to a fraction of one will reduce the size. Setting the microlock2 symbols folder path is necessary when you're going to utilize live view for a microlock2 program. Because Signal Scout needs files that are generated when accessing a MicroLock2 program through the Ansaldo development system, you need to provide Signal Scout with the path that that application is installed at. By default, this location is C backslash Ansaldo. Therefore, that is the default path that is placed into Signal Scout. If you've installed it at a different location, you'll simply need to click on the ellipses button on the right and select that location. So this has been an overview of how to install and use Semaphore Software's Signal Scout. Um, hopefully this answers any questions about how the software works. If you'd like to set up with a demo or a free trial, please reach out to us at the information provided in the video description below. And if you have any questions or Anything else that you'd like to learn or know about Signal Scout, uh, please reach out to us and we'd be happy to answer any questions and hear from you. Thank you.